Welcome to another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today we have a Berlin bound episode together with Stefan Skupin, who yeah, I'm very glad that you can join us today, Stefan. First of all, um, a warm welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Um, so to get us started, we met, okay, which year was it now? 2018? Um, um or was it sorry, um confusing the years. So in my capacity of being a mentor in the Wikimedia Germany Open Science Fellowship Program, we met um and were matched together with um fellow and mentor, um, where you were working on a project which I still today find very much interesting and relevant for the African region in particular, and can probably um um, introduce that uh, is that better than I can, <laughs> even though we've worked together on it for quite some time. And yeah, to be launched and released soon to the world, um, which is a, an open funding database for funding opportunities for African mm. researchers and research mm. stakeholders. Um, but yeah, so that will be today's topic, but also. Um, Let's first hear from you what your interest in um, open science is. You also now work in the capacity of being a project manager, coordinator, um, department head at the Berlin University Alliance, um, coordinating the open science activities in the Berlin region and also cross-cutting on a national level, I suppose. So it would be, well, that's basically your institutional um capacity but what brought you to that position and how do you find open science implementation happens so a lot of questions to to address in this conversation but to um avoid me speaking as much at this point let's hear from you so yeah wh where are you coming from with regards to your research topics and interests and how how did you get into this now um coordinating position for open science um, yes, um, um, I'll be glad to uh, outline that, uh, and it both connects um, quite well. So my background is I'm a political scientist um, by training, um, and um, I did my PhD on a um, constitution making in Ghana in the early 90s. Um, so I um, and I was uh, part of volunteer of a Berlin-based uh, Cameroon and Berlin-based. Uh, organization called Africa Avenir, uh, where they did a lot of um, what we call um, educational programs, um, screening films in Berlin um, since uh, my studies. So I've been um, in contact with um, many um, um, topics and people from, from African countries, um, which I found inspiring and uh, which led me to um, pursue this PhD project. And um, so I finished the PhD in 2013. Um, unbelievable, already like 10 years ago. Um, and we, uh, or I, I, I went on and I worked for a bit in higher education administration, like at Berlin universities. And I learned uh, more about the inner workings of universities um, at two at the Humboldt University and at Freie University, and um, both also gave me insight that led me to a research project, which was um, um, then um, acknowledged and, and by funding from Volkswagen Foundation. And there, I asked the question: Is um, how do uh, researchers from African and European backgrounds uh, navigate the funding landscape and the funding situations in collaborative research projects. Um, and I focused on tropical medicine and um, on research uh, on renewable energy. So both topics um, led me to interviews uh, in eight African countries. Uh, I had a, a research stay in, in South Africa and um, I, doing the research, I collected a lot of funding information, which were then only based in a privately accessible um, Microsoft Access database. And then um, we had this opportunity coming along um, with the uh, fellowship program. 
and I applied for uh, a fellowship um, with the project to get all the information that I collected in the project um, into open data and not only uh, publishing the research data that I had, but also to build a open source database that can be used by others um, if they also have similar interest in collecting information. So um, I was selected um, gladly and had the chance to learn more about open science. Actually, I only knew about open access uh, as a researcher before uh, because I had I wanted to use open access, but I, I wasn't like any part of the already emerging or long-standing open source community or the emerging open science uh, community uh, mm. whatsoever. So that was my first contact with open science. Uh, this fellowship and I learned quite a lot in this one year and gladly uh, we worked together um, and in this uh, project. Yes, and now, um, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but as it happens, um, the fellowship fell right into um, the, the, the end of the fellowship fell right into Corona uh, begin in co into Corona's beginning and um, the database was finished uh, with help of Dean uh, Keaton from um, South Africa, um, who who built the whole uh, database, and which is now just laying at um, GitLab, but it has already been used by an NGO, but, which is nice to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a test one with uh, funding programs. If you want, I can just go into why I find funding programs uh, interesting. Yes, please. Okay. And let's discuss uh, a bit because in my view, and as we we recall, we discussed this a little bit also in, um, previously, but now on record um, for others to chime in. Yeah, it's a bit of a double-edged sword in some aspects, but let's hear your view first. It's a, thank you. It, it's very it's very ambivalent. Um, um, doing my research, I of course looked into the whole um, critical studies of. Um, uh, research collaborations between uh, partners that have, have different resources. Um, but as you, some say, North-South collaborations, Global North, Global South. Um, and um, for example, if you look at the UNESCO data, um, which is a bit sketchy because UNESCO data is not as clean as we thought, but it's always used as an argument. Um, but if you look at the UNESCO data, you will find uh, uh, many countries actually not delivering data. So we, we don't know much about um, how research and development um, is um, being funded in, in some African countries, for example. Mm -hmm. But the data we have, uh, at least until 2010, it's quite complete. Um, you will find that um, African countries um, expectedly um, not only uh, have less funds for um, for research and development. Um, my, my background is German. Um, we know in Germany that 60% uh, of our research and development funds come from industry, uh, a bit more than 30 come from public sources, and then you have private funding uh, a bit more. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's quite a large amount. It, it, uh, it accounts uh, to around 3% of, uh, of our GDP. And if you compare that to um, quite a lot of African countries, then you will find that not only in uh, relative terms, um, uh, funding is less, meaning uh, in relative terms, uh, terms saying that uh, the nation or the, the state cannot invest as much as, as Germany, but also in absolute terms, um, the money is, is less and um, you have less uh, investment from industry um, for, for some, some, some obvious reasons and some reasons that we, we could go into further. Um, and, um, and you will find very different um, approaches from, from African countries um, uh, to kind of leverage with the fund they have. Um, so having a lot of international collaborations, um, the European Union Commission started uh, programs with uh, on the on the regional level, but also a lot of bilateral programs, where you find a lot of uh, like um, countries from Western Europe, from the US, but also Japan, China, and South Korea and Australia, um, funding research collaborations, funding researchers mobility, funding research training, um, and adding to the um, 
research uh, uh, capacity landscape. I know the term research capacity building is contested, but um, let's use it for the moment sure. for the lack of better alternative. It can also be used neutrally. I mean, it just means, well, it can come easily with a power dynamic to it, like who's building capacity and with what motives. But like, I think we can all agree that there's a lot of capacity building needed all over the world when it comes to open science or research integrity practices generally. So I'm fine with the term for now. Yeah, you will find, um, and the history is quite um, oh. dark and like very power ridden, as you say. Um, yeah, you will find in the 90s a lot of um, biomedical studies uh, happening in, in African countries. And there you will, uh, the terms were coined like parachute scientist or um, the safari scientist who just come in to collect uh, probes and then just go to um, uh, laboratories in, in the US or in other countries. You will find some of these relations have changed. There's more ambivalence today. Um, uh, you will find evidence for researchers who have built um, with the help of others, like let's look at the Japanese funding of a, a high quality um, a laboratory in Ghana, mm -hmm. which uh, contributed to uh, sequencing some of the first probes of Corona vi uh, virus in uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. So um, and they're building on this investment and um, of course, uh, training a lot of Ghanaian researchers medical staff um, and enhancing the capacities. And you will find that some of them are um, doing very well. Um, you will find others who are leveraging on the funds they get from Wellcome Trust um, in, in Kenya, the uh, African Academy of Sciences. Um, and they're using these programs for, um, for their own um, uh, benefit. And uh, so, during this research, um, I was traveling in African countries, um, in, in eight African countries, to, to do interviews. Um, and I met some of the doctoral students or postdoctoral students um, at the universities after interviews. I was quite a often approached to with the send with the with the question of, "Hey, where can I get funding? Mm. You do research about funding. Can you tell me where can I get funding?" And that was quite a bit embarrassing for me because I couldn't help them. Um, I did research about uh, the impact of funding, about the navigating the funding landscape, but I couldn't tell them uh, or couldn't even help them with, um, you know, I, I can help you with getting funding. And um, there, uh, we did a, a research into how available are funding sources um, in these countries, um, like Cote d'Ivoire, like uh, Ghana or um, uh, Tanzania. And um, of course, there you have uh, little national funding, but you have a variety, a variety of um, international funders. But then you would also always have to go to individual sites. Um, there are only a few sites, uh, websites that collect all that of them. There are commercial, um, um, p um, commercial um, platforms who, mm -hmm. who sell actually the information to universities. Um, and if you go to LinkedIn, you get job offers. Um, if you get to, um, if you go to others, um, you will get the information. And I wanted to use um, all the the research and put it into an open database so everyone can use it. And here comes my second interest, which is still a research interest from my side. But I know there's a spillover effect for others um, to use it actually to to find funding. Um, I am more interested into how. Funders are actually shaping research topics and avail um, um, availabilities by setting up criteria for who can apply, um, what topics are being funded. Mm -hmm. um, so you only have the UNESCO data who, who gives you some sort of idea how much money is being invested. Um, there's a lack of information about what is actually being funded. And we know from some studies that biomedical studies are quite a huge sector, um, which also receives a lot of funding. Um, there are some, we, we can link it um, uh, to this um, blog post, um, the study or publish it elsewhere. Um, but it would be interesting how these um, funding calls are actually shaping the availability and possibility of doing research mm. Um, for African researchers. Yeah, that's a complaint I've heard while engaging with some of the stakeholders around this topic. 
on the continent in various countries that there's funding available from outside of Africa, outside the national funding schemes and opportunities, which comes with a dictate of what mm -hmm. should be researched on, which often uh, diverts away from the actual research interests the researchers have and see also use of for the societies they want to serve with their research. And not saying that none of that is possible also with international or non-African funding, but I think this is a recurring complaint that, yeah, the actual, the the research that most that's mostly relevant for like on a regional and local level is just hard to find funding for, and when there's funding available, then it's usually going elsewhere with the funding interests. And these are probably also interesting topics to the research and just not so regionally and locally relevant. But yeah. that's, I think that's also valid if you think about it. It's, it's um, because of what, like a Western or American or European funder would of course prioritize European interests in providing money for certain kinds of research. And then the question is how much um like how much authority to how the money is being spent should be given to the grantees of that money but that's a bit of a i don't know if we are the right people to address that question <laughs> of course on a democratically i don't know of in a purpose oriented funding scheme there would be equal weight for both parties to discuss and agree upon on the shared interest but because if you invest in a specific region and continent, you should also take the local interest into account. And the question is to what degree is that even happening or is the capacity therefore time-wise and HR-wise? Just raising these so, issues. Uh, yeah, so, sorry to interrupt. Um, to, um, those are very good um, observations. I, uh, I am thinking of um, a researcher in the biomedical field from uh, Cote d'Ivoire who showed me um, her lab, and it was outside of a hospital, um, of a regional hospital, and, and she showed me quite with proudness um, all the instruments she has gathered to do to do research, to, to not give um, data or probes um, out of hand before she has done the research so, uh, on it. And she said that she doesn't sign any contract any longer. Um, that says that she is helping collecting probes and then the probes go out of the country. Um, so she has now the availability, um, the, she has the instruments to do the research herself. And then maybe some American researchers or or European researchers are um, a, can do other, other research with it. Um, so there are like pockets of, um, of um, a, capacity that led we that led researchers to actually do their own agenda um and the other one is um i remember uh, interviewing someone from a, a veterinarian um, um uh, department uh, in zambia who was then again telling me um we are waiting for african swine pest to come up in europe to get funding for african swine pest mm -hmm. because of that that's kind of underlying the point that you just made that of course there's a lot of european interest in the funding but it's I, I guess we have to differentiate uh one thing is um or maybe two things um you will find this effect also in european funding so the whole research funding landscape has changed and um uh, since the 80s um approximately 90s where um, a lot of funding goes into project funding and a lot of funding goes into um, assigned funding and mission-driven funding with an interest by a society like organized in politics or uh, industry to actually get results out of science or out of the academy to, um, to have like products um, or to have service development or to actually apply the research that's been done at universities. Um, a lot of project funding is shaping also research in, in European countries. And it would be interesting to compare um, the, the strategies of how to deal with this um, um, funding situation. Where you also in Germany, you have a, a very high percentage of um, postdoctorates who are living from like third party funding contracts from one to the other, and they have to look out for funding and fit their topics into um, funding landscape 
there is a difference, of course. The basic funding for researchers, the basic like infrastructure, is already there, and it's 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 a very um and with a lot of um comes along with a lot of opportunities um to to have basic funding at universities. And this base kind of basic funding is much lower at African universities, of course, um, and research institutes, and that can only be substituted by uh, foreign funders. Um, marginally. So that is also why there are a lot of researchers within African countries call up on the government to invest more into research and development, particularly in basic funding, to get actually the, the frameworks done and on which basis you can have stuff and laboratory and then you apply for funding uh, to do actual research projects. So that this is also the asymmetry um, mm. taking place at the moment. Yeah. yeah. I feel like this is also an interesting topic and surely being addressed by the team of Open Science Group at UNESCO around Anna Passage and some of the working groups addressing various aspects of how the recently released Open Science Recommendations or Recommendations by UNESCO, which were also a consortial um, a consultation uh, across the world with various stakeholders from around the world, um, and now how this can be implemented, informing also the funders and also learning from the funders and how they, as you said, set priorities and define the funding schemes and criteria and how that um, influences, as you, as you pointed out, what kind of research is happening in what parts of the world and how can we balance that better because there is clearly an imbalance as many of us observe and experience. Um, and this is like you can always blame the system, and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that is necessarily the the fault of individuals who are decision makers in certain positions at various institutions. But we are the system. I keep saying when people tend to criticize the system, like we are now the system, so we have an opportunity to change it and to balance it better <laughs> to what we inherited from previous generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and um, I, I guess that that's also the interest in how teams or individual researchers are navigating and trying to to find the uh, opportunity to do what they very much like to do, um, and that includes um, also applying for uh, scholarships to go to Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, wherever, and then um, have funds paid by Microsoft to go back to Kenya uh, to work in computer science, um, just um, to, to to have as an individual, as a team, the opportunity to do research at all. Um, that's quite um, encouraging to see that, um, to, and, and to meet such inspiring people who have, who have done it and then who use uh, the knowledge and the network they, they have acquired um, during their, graduate studies and, and postgraduate studies to um, to make an impact on their own, let's say, science system, uh, which is very often uh, defined in national terms, but uh, as science is an international enterprise and depends on international networks, yeah, you, you of course, um, uh, goes beyond the national border. You will find um, a, a interesting approaches and, and I, my expertise is, um, let's say, my expertise is on um, most on the African region. I have no comparison to other regions except for like reading, uh, one uh, reading interesting papers, but I have no no research expertise there. Is that South Africa is um, reaching out to install uh, sort of research funds with other African countries? So um, South Africa itself um, being more and more embedded in um, research networks uh, with the global north, with China, with other countries. Um, is itself becoming a funder uh, in the uh, on the African continent. Um, likewise, you will find, um, and and that's interesting how how they how they deal with like let's say bilateral programs. So how South Africa and Uganda coming together and say, okay, we're gonna cross fund or we're gonna co fund uh, research on this area, and then um, South Africa, of course, has a higher leverage um, or has has more capacities. Uh, then Uganda, but they uh, they find together and um, try to fund research that they consider um, important. And and here comes an interesting aspect uh, that 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 
I guess um, I, I, it wasn't new when I came to it, <laughs> but it, it's a development orientation of research in, mm -hmm. in, in the rhetoric of many national research development plans in African countries. Um, you read a lot of uh, science strategies um, that are, um, are full of um, um, science needs to um, contribute to social, economic, and other developments. Um, which is uh, totally le legitimate and the same happens in Europe as well. Um, and um, so there's this kind of um, agenda setting, which is not only coming from scientists. Um, and the other form is that in the African context, you can often observe that instead of science funders from abroad, you will find a development aid funders uh, funding research in African countries. And they are bound to their own logic saying mm -hmm. that um, you need to fund uh, development-related projects. And maybe that also explains some of the um, pressure that African scientists experience when they have different sort of funders, um, which, which have different logics. Mm -hmm. But um, we, we, were, um, we, we were getting away from the, from the open science aspect. And, uh, and, and yeah, I, I think would... it's all, I feel funding is like, is like the key pillar to anything open science capacity building. Because like wherever in the world, because without funding or without a revenue stream of some sort or financial considerations, there's nothing to be achieved really. And funding, mm. research funding at institutional and individual level, when we look at fellowships or master students or PhD students, so at any level, are the drivers for also open science to be able to unfold and be implemented at an institutional and individual level for researchers to have the headspace and the capacity time-wise and financially, like to have the ease yeah. of mind to actually embrace open science with all its new concepts and work workflows. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So you, you need to have uh, the right framework for research to be done uh, to actually then open research. Mm. Um, I, I guess at, at, at the moment we, we discuss, for example, uh, different forms of open access uh, to publications. And then um, I'm, I'm very sure that you all are aware of the studies that have been done that um, despite uh, the many publications that are now open access, um, there's another um, a negative effect for researchers who cannot afford to pay for actually gold open access or um, who are not eligible for any waivers um, and at the moment publishing um, the publishing houses are uh, reshaping these waiver systems mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, on the one hand research becomes easier with open access but of course if, if your university or uh, your um, your national funder cannot uh, provide funds to publish open gold, uh, open gold, open access. Uh, yeah. which means can I can I you right there because that's what's really driving me nuts since a while now and moving forward. I well, sorry if I interrupt now. Not what you said, yeah, but yes, what you said, but not to accuse you of anything. But like, can we just acknowledge the fact that? To publish a research article should not, by far not, like explicitly not have to cost anything beyond 1000, whatever currency you want to apply, meaning mostly USD, uh, euros, or G, what is it, British pounds. Like that's just out of any scope and, and relevant, like, like it's not appropriate to charge that much for publishing a research article. It's just not. So if we think of, and there's been calculations in all kinds of realms, and it seems like the rule of thumb is that um, the amount today and for the past five or so years of what it costs to actually process a research article that we know today, and that's also changing, um, from submission of a manuscript to typesetting, layouting, uh, peer review coordination, whatever, should not go beyond three to 500, 300 or 500 euros or US dollars or British pounds. Like that's yeah. a reasonable price. And 
most often it can way be way below that. But to keep a system running, it shouldn't cost anything beyond that. And anything in the yeah. one or two or three or five or ten thousands is just a ripoff. Like it's like I need to pull this out so clearly because this is my show. <laughs> so I can, but I wouldn't I wouldn't be so outraged in like in another kind of format or in a in a kind of discussion of whatever other organization. But or maybe I will be in the future because to to argue, um, oh we don't have the money or we have to allocate the money for open access to be affordable. Like no, just make clear to those stakeholders who charge so much that that's the price we're willing to pay and nothing more. Like nothing beyond that amount because it doesn't make sense. It's not sustainable for the institution or anywhere when we want to achieve anything open science related mm -hmm. or research integrity at large because. So me, open science is like just another word for research integrity and open. Just I have this briefly mentioned here and it doesn't have to be the discussion point, but open doesn't necessarily mean everything has to be open. It's just like opening up to applicability and implementability, implementability of the research outcomes by other stakeholders. And that can in part still be closed very much so for good reasons, but this needs to be assessed thoroughly and so yeah, sorry to interrupt. So could we could you just like if we if I throw if I put the ball in your corner again, could you rephrase what you were just about to say? Like maybe no, highlight I, the pressure no. points that certain stakeholders charge a certain amount, and yes, the pressure is real and on, and we need to find ways out of that pressure system. And there is various ways out, but they will probably take time. And that's the situation we're dealing with today, probably just trying to have you rephrase. Um, I, I cannot uh, like speak for for uh, colleagues from 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 African universities or research centers. Um, this is what we discuss here uh, in in Europe um, in in Berlin actually. Um, so, um, what what I actually wanted to say is that open science becomes uh, open science practices like. Publishing open access, um, um, making available your research data in a fair and um, um, sustainable manner. Um, it's also helping, or it's also, yeah, helping um, science systems to to save some cost um, and invest the cost in in basic research um, equipment and and personnel. Mm. So, I. Um, and I, but I also agree with you that we need a lot of pressure to to get down these prices. Um, I, I have no. I mean, it, it has become a, like a kind of market good um, to to sell um, access to publicly funded research. Um, I, I guess I wouldn't have a problem with industry funded research to be um, called open access because then industry can can pay for it if it has an interest. Mm -hmm. But uh, especially the publicly funded uh, research is. Um, it's a public good, um, but there are some who contest that science, scientific products are public good. I guess that is something that we could pick up in another uh, podcast. Um, but it's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's it's, uh, it's a dilemma, but uh, put pressure on it. I mean, a lot of researchers want to publish in nature, so they are they're willing to pay uh, the price. It's like yeah. entering uh, a more expensive fitness club. Um, you, you pay for club good despite being a public officer or public servant it's, yeah, it's really um, it's, yeah, it's difficult yeah. i think it's also a human desire that's quite natural to us as a species to kind of aiming for prestige we want to belong to a group of an elitist group of some sort and it also looks shiny looks good on your cv to have published in a certain venue but I mean, my my dogma here, or what I usually say in this context, is it shouldn't matter where you publish, but what you publish, because the layouting and everything that's not a big deal nowadays. Anything digitally published can be nicely layouted by somebody who's never, you know, done any training or studied kind of digital design like you you have all kinds of tools readily available at your fingertips so that's not a price point anymore what the like and yeah so it's not get diverted too much yeah, i don't know about the human nature thing um yeah, I, I it's guess just it's a wide assumption 
Bueno. As a social scientist talking to an uh, biologist, I guess so we have our um, different angles. Um, it has a history. It has a history, definitely, like this um, marketization of um, uh, journals, uh, scientific journals after the Second World War. Um, it it, um, it had a history that shaped our habits. And um, yeah, so, but we wanted to talk about um, how open science can actually foster it. And, um, uh, or can can foster alternative practices. I mean, for example, in Germany, we are uh, we have a lot of um, open access policies um, at universities, and if you look at these uh, open access policies, which are quite binding, um, or at least uh, an expression of the will of universities to add to open access uh, during the last twenty years, you will find a lot of encouraging um formulations um to toward the researchers because in germany we have this article five in our basic law um which say that the the freedom of uh of uh, of, of science or of, of the academy um um is a it's a very high value and it's often uh, researchers come and say it's a uh uh, uh it, in position on our constitutionally guaranteed right to um, actually force us to to uh, publish open access. But uh, uh, at the moment, um, I, I guess it has also become a market mechanism because in, in, in at least in Berlin, we know that we are now at 60% open access and, and much of it is of course gold open access, but a lot of it is also green open access, meaning you, you publish your um, either one year behind your publication or your, your last print before publication, you put it on a repository. Um, mm -hmm. And these open access policies I was speaking about are always encouraging uh, researchers and scientists um, and, and, and authors to use these kind of rights um, to, to publish actually um, um, after six months or after or publish the preprint um, uh, or the last version before um, it goes into print as uh, as as open access um and so you will find a lot of data that is uh, a lot of research results that that are already open access uh, and peer reviewed um mm -hmm. so the, the question for me is uh, how do you exploit it um how do you find orientation and um within all these repositories and i guess that's also a question for you and uh, Africa archives um yeah. Um, maybe maybe I could just uh, ask this question to you. How do you um, give orientation and uh, what apparently journals like Science and Nature are offering? I don't know. Yeah, that's basically, it's become the key um, service point that we deliver as Africa Archive. So we started as a preprint repository to make it easy for African scholars to showcase their work and thereby avoid the barriers that especially African authors often experience in editorial boards and being rejected with their submissions without often, I don't know how often that actually happens, but there's also been research into how regional biases, you can also call it racism, um, led to the rejection of the submissions for coming from Africa to Western journal editorial boards. Um, so to avoid that from happening, we thought we go in line with the then trend to establish discipline-specific repositories and now starting one for the region of Africa to bring the stakeholders from that region together and also to allow any researcher on the continent to, to share their work with whoever has um, access to the internet. That's the only limitation, basically. And with ensuring also a quality standard based on best practices for scholarly publishing with the COPE, the Committee of um, Open Publishing Ethics, or of, of Publishing Ethics, not necessarily open, so the co committee um, to follow the MRAT structure and all of that. But now what we then learned over the years, and it's, we're now in our fifth year, um, is that, yes, what you exactly say is not only in Africa, but around the world, researchers tend to not deposit their outcomes into an institutional repository where it would be easy for the institution to measure the research output com coming from the institution or university, and then also thereby having better matrices for any university or whatever rankings that are happening, which are highly biased. 
just as a side note, and you and I know that, and there's many other out there who also know that. So to to provide ownership is just technically not possible today. So there's various repositories, um, preprint repositories, journals um, around the world um, with five publishers owning, I don't know, 80 or 90% of the journals that we now have, or maybe not that much, but quite uh, the bigger bulk. Um, so with Africa Archive, we, um, and also with the International African Institute, um, in 2020, we, um, we, uh, we put data that the International African Institute had on their website into a spreadsheet to map institutional repositories across the continent, and then also mapping along the generalist um, repositories that we as Africa Archive work with, and also those that we don't work with, um, to put them all into one map on uh, to to if, yeah basically to be able to. Um, resolve an image of on a national and institutional level where the research is going to and where it can be discovered. If somebody would want to know, I want to know about agricultural research from and about Kenya or Zimbabwe, then there's not one place you want to look at, which was probably the first stop would be Scopus of Web of Science for most scholars. And that might give you today a much better view than just two years ago, because they've also upped their game in, in being more inclusive of their sources. But um, we um, provide access to, but we map the institutional repositories, which are often not being picked up by any indexing services. We map um, not Scopus and Web of Science because they're closed systems, but Dimensions and the Lens and Base Search and Google Search in a national scope to to showcase what research is 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 discoverable from and about that country, and then that can be further investigated on an institutional level where we don't have the like not we we are far from a hundred percent of um resolution of what research there actually is and that relies a lot on persistent identifiers like ORCID and OR for institutional registration and that's not being implemented um, as much as it could be but that's what we're working towards now this year and we've started mapping this in 2020 and continuously so does that answer your question or what else could I explain better to make it comprehensible no, it's just, I guess it's a general question of um, if you want to replace um, the, the kind of uh, system today uh, where procedure journals are uh, often attracting a lot of attention like uh, and, 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 and are becoming more costly because mm. of that, they know of their market value. I guess that um, publishing in nature wouldn't cost as much um, in uh, as it costs today if you only look for covering your costs and not um, uh, not more. Um, so um, if the alternative is that we all publish green open access or um, or diamond open access, then and who becomes the next, um, um, let's say, um, like compass, like sort of a, who gives us orientation? I mean, that that would actually be a that kind of more general question, and um, it will be interesting to follow up on Africa archives in the next years and see um, who's publishing on Af uh, um, Africa archives and um, which disciplines, because that brings me to one point: is that we have very different publication, let's say, behavior uh, among the disciplines. Uh, you, we we did a study in uh, in Berlin among uh, many researchers and asked them about their publication behaviors regarding open access. And um, you will find that engineers uh, natural and natural scientists have no problem uh, with, um, actually have no issues with um, open access because they're used to it, um, given their publication um, and discussion culture of, um, of communicating uh, research results within research communities and outside. So um, you also have uh, these disciplinary differences or um, faculty differences um, that that come into play, but um, um, yeah, we um, 
did this research to get a better overview of uh, of, of the actually the open science um, attitudes, um, um, judgments, and uh, practices uh, among uh, researchers from Berlin, and um, we found these uh, disciplinary differences uh, at uh, quite quite hard, like social sciences, humanities are not used, uh, don't have a long culture of um, publishing only papers, but are being bound to books and uh, uh, edited volumes, um, mm -hmm. being much more critical of um, publishing open access um, or, or afraid of commercialization of, of the research results. Yeah, and uh, I think yeah. also just to add diamonds is also not fully evolved as a system that can be sustainable because there is there are costs that are going to be incurred there there are costs to be covered and the question is always who's covering the costs and how can we distribute the costs across the stakeholders mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. who should pay and who should not pay because they already paid in terms of time they invested or you know should a research grant also cover for publishing or not um, what other subsidizing schemes are in place, in what disciplines, and that's highly diverse, as you pointed out. So, um, like diamond, or there's another color that's being used. Oh God. Um, yeah, so I think any way forward would probably either generalize um, and allow for a mixed funding approach, which also includes gold open access, which where gold just says like the researchers also add their share mm -hmm. um, or the reader adds their share. And that might be useful in some, some cases for industrial relevant research um, or whichever I'm just making up scenarios. So I think each of the systems or the, the revenue streams that we have now make sense in its own corner. And the question is now, how can we streamline that across the disciplines and with the new approach and, and also decolonizing academia, but also making it more equitable within the country and across disciplines, because also social sciences are usually underfunded, painfully so. And there's a lot of work that goes into a book so naturally, social scientists would argue against having the book being available open access just or as an open educational resource without any compensation for the work that's been done beyond mm -hmm. the payslip that people have for their for their salaries. Anyways, so yeah, that's I like I'm not a finance expert, I'm also not in scholar, it's just that. Some of these aspects also consider us with Africa Archive, because I also need to see how I get my own time covered and that of the team and compensated for. So in some aspects, I have, I'm, I'm also involved in these discussions indirectly, but thankfully we're not the only ones. And okay, so let's come back to the database that you've built um, or conceptualized and built with, what's his name? The colleague in South Dean. Africa. With Dean. Dean. So we will certainly link to the GitLab where it's lying. And how can we now develop that further? What are the next steps? And some of which we discussed to anchor it with an African archive, maybe also with non-African or non-exclusively African um, institutions, because it probably can easily be expanded for other purposes or repurposed and um, open for other world regions. Also, but what what is your ideal way for it that you see for the project? Um, what I would like to see is um, that the um, the framework is um, is used by by uh, persons who also offer um, an oversight of of research um, positions or research funding uh, for their own communities, um, like some sort of a crowd uh, funded. Um, uh, database that uh, where it's not about crowdfunding for actually um, monetary reasons, but for data, uh, where for example um, we can share the coverage of um, the funders. Um, there's a, a list of funders, about uh, nearly a hundred funders, um, who publish uh, funding calls and who are um, 
relevant for the database. So the database can be, become a community um, issue and it can be uh, placed in different um, sectors or in different uh, blocks um, where everyone can use data uh, he feeds, if he, he or she feeds into it. Mm. Um, that will be a community effort um, to uh, have a reliable source and also to um, support evidence based um, science policy making um, I can imagine that um, there will be interest in, in linking data uh, in the sense of um, there, there, there are archives of evaluations of research programs so one could um, link uh, evaluation reports into this to um, to get a better understanding of how did the research program worked who was uh, who was participating um, and eventually um, I could um, imagine that it's um, actually not only used for uh, science policy making, but also for the um, for for African researchers who look for funding um, and are successful, not um, um, wanting to replace um, any pub, uh, commercial database, but but offer uh, a better like a, a easier access to this kind of information in a very um, structured way mm. so yeah, that can also be uh, reproduced and um, and used in other places um, I, there, there's a documentation of the database that which we, we will link to um, with the GitLab instance and then um, I'm available for questions and I guess um, and that was uh, something that we can still learn from a lot of um, um, regions um, in the world for example, uh, from Latin America, and we got to open access and also the financing of open access um, repositories. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that um, there, there's um, a, lot, a lot of to, to learn from mm. for this, um, uh, also for the database um, that on, on research funding. Yeah, I agree. And it will be interesting to see as we present this to a wider audience and also invite for collaboration crowdfunding and crowdsourcing to actually provide um, data for the database to be functional and useful. Um, yeah, it will be interesting to engage with, as you say, with the stakeholders in other regions or for various use cases of such a database. And it, to what extent it can be centralized for a continent with it to be implemented in various institutional levels versus customized for specific use cases elsewhere. That'd be cool. Do you see, because you mentioned there are um, commercial providers of such funding opportunities. And I've also met one at a recent conference in Berlin. Um, so how do you see the open source one and open, yeah, open sourced one and open source database be complementary or competitive to the commercial providers? Is that something you've thought about? It's probably an open-ended topic to, to observe for the future. It, it is indeed. Um, I, I guess um, being competitive would require a lot of resources. Um, and um, that's why I was proposing um, crowd searching uh, for, for funds uh, of funding opportunities. Um, there are also like some some intermediate um, associations who take a small fee for cover their costs. Mm. Um, so I haven't thought about any cost model yet. Um, cost coverage is uh, at the moment is quite low. Um, it's only the database and hosting um, and and free time um, uh, and the scholarship we uh, from the fellowship program we used to build the database. So Dean built the database and uh, the front end. Uh, was built by a colleague um, and um, no I, I haven't thought about being competitive or complementary um, I, I, I'm pretty sure that Research Europe or Research Africa have quite a comprehensive database um, to, um, but they sell it to, um, to universities um, mm -hmm. it's a service offer um, yeah and but I'm, I'm thinking maybe it's also fair. First of all, it's good to have several options on the market or as uh, uh, usable and accessible. Um, and then the content can be filled by the community. 
and the community can either decide as an institution, we want to work with a corporate service provider, which allocates the data that we are actually interested in for us and then pay for that, or the community, which does not necessarily have the means or wants to invest um, certain amounts into such a service, could mobilize um, uh, their members to feed content to an open source system, which, and none of the systems will be holistically inclusive. Mm -hmm. So, and that then empowers the community at large to, to some extent, being able to compare mm -hmm. the different sources and then make a, get a bigger picture of what's actually available as in funding sources. So I, I think immediately it's not necessarily competitive, but it's more complementary from how I see it. But that's to be seen as we roll it out. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Let's see um, uh, how it works out. Um, Dean has already come up with some new ideas of how making it more efficient and uh, and and linking it um, to uh, within the database. Um, so I'm I'm keen to speak to him um, next week and talk about the the improvement of the database but uh, let's see how our listeners will um actually um have any comments on it um i'm very open for for any comments or questions or hints um to to improve the database mm -hmm. yeah brilliant well with all these tough topics that we touched upon during the conversation i think we have a very bright looking way forward <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and for sharing all your insights and your opinions and thoughts on, on all of these topics and also for doing the work with the database to be rolled out now. Um, so watch this space, everyone. Also, Africa Archive and our partner institutions for funding opportunities for African research and research stakeholders. And yeah, and then everybody else is welcome to use the database for their own purpose, as we discussed. Uh, any final um, remarks you want to share? Oh, we didn't mention like the research because I see the poster in the back behind your yourself. Um, do you want yeah. to um, say a few words around the kind of research you engaged in? Um, yes, uh, like after the um, uh, fellowship program, I became much more engaged in uh, in the sort of uh, sociology of open science. Uh, and um, from the fellowship program, uh, colleagues and I we did a mapping, a scoping review of uh, approximately, um, I guess we had about over 600 studies um, dealing with different open science practices and uh, we published our data. Uh, we have a poster and uh, we want to, to work on that. And this is research not um, where you have like open science in the title only, but it's empirical research about um, open science practices. So if you're interested in using this data, it's also open access the data is available. Uh, it's kind of a scoping literature uh, review, but uh, you can easily find the literature mm. uh, because we tag them with uh, using the open uh, using the the descriptions of open science practices and the methods that were applied, the countries that were covered, um, and we got some um, some surprising and some so not surprising results. Um, mm -hmm. um, what was surprising, yeah. just to mention one as a teaser, cliffhanger. The, um, yeah, um, of, um, I mean, um, surprising uh, empirical studies, we found a lot of empirical studies um, that use bibliometric methods. Um, I guess that they're actually the majority of the methods that were applied. Um, and um, and we found uh, we found quite a, a large community of librarians who uh, engage in the um, in publishing about open science practices. That that was quite um, interesting. Um, I guess um, coming from the open access field, of course, counting publications that are open access or the citation amount is not so surprising. But um, um, yeah, cool. Uh, we can yeah. share the link. Yeah. So yeah, we share the link to the poster and the study as well. Thanks for sharing that. And I've also just released, uh, and to be also continued to be worked on and expanded a uh, mapping of open science resources to which this very much um, is relevant and was added. 
and should have been added long ago. But um, yeah, this is a recent ad hoc initiative um, of open science resources by discipline, which is also then searchable by open science principle, where general open science guidelines are their own node. So that will also be, so we will also, I'll also add the link to that um, preprint if you want to. Well, okay. Um, and and I think with that, we have quite a lot of, yeah, for everyone to dig deeper into the topics that we addressed mm -hmm. today. Thank you so much, Stefan. Thanks again for having me. It was a pleasure to uh, talk in this format with you. Yeah, and it's, I'm looking forward to yeah, continue the collaboration around this. Um, me and, too. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.